and we're going to unpack it and look at some of the hugeness in the next half hour or so. Um, when I use this idea that programs are similar to computers in the same way mind-body states are to minds, what we're seeing here is the possibility of the recognition that just as we can install a very large number of programs into our computers and do a number of different things depending on the programs that we use, the same thing is true of our minds. We can install a number of information processing programs called mind-body states or states of consciousness in our minds. And once you start looking at it this way, mind-body states become friendly sorts of things that you try to use and develop and possibly even write new programs for. So I'll be looking at that major idea, and then underneath it we return every once in a while to this one called, is the reprogrammable mind adaptogenic? That is, do these programs allow us to adapt in ways that we haven't been able to before? And this will be a nice introduction to Michael Winkleman's more technical work on the brain and how that works into adaptability. I'll be looking more at the, in the cognitive social area. Um, I start with what I call the single state fallacy. And this is one that our culture typically makes. It's the erroneous assumption that all worthwhile abilities reside in our ordinary mind-body state. Now, this comes from two very different sources, actually more than two. One um, Stan mentioned this morning, which is Freudian or psychodynamic psychology. In Freudian or psychodynamic psychology, the way we're supposed to think is on our wake, adult, logical, rational thinking, Freud called a secondary process thinking. And all other, everything else gets shoved down into that awful cesspool called the unconscious. Well, um, so altered states are among the things that get shoved down into the unconscious with all this uh, negative violence and sexuality and uh, antisocial behaviors. Uh, the other is uh, the, I think probably a misunderstanding of the Enlightenment which looked at uh, rational thought as being the way to discover and understand the world. The problem is not that the Enlightenment was wrong. I'm a great fan of our ordinary state and of rational thought. Um, but the problem is thinking that that's the only way to use our minds. So it's the exclusiveness um, of the, of the uh, Enlightenment that's the problem, not the idea of using um, um, other mind-body states themselves. So what this does is takes me into an area um, that I've developed called uh, multi-state mind theory. And if you start with the single state fallacy and then you recognize we can use our minds in lots of other states, this naturally develops um, into, well, how, do we do, how are we going to look at the mind and to take account of all these various mind-body states? So uh, I've developed mind-body theory uh, with uh, three major interacting ideas. The first is the idea of a mind-body state. This is also called uh, states of consciousness. I don't use consciousness because it's too ambiguous. Um, we can go into that later during a question period if you want. But basically, I say I like mind-body state to talk about the combined state that the mind and the body are in at any one time. This is a direct movement from Charles Tart's idea of, of altered state of consciousness. I just call them mind-body states. And the advantage of this also is that it points out that we're talking about mind-body as one unified thing. I'm uh, go having an argument right now with an editorial board of a book, and they want to hyphenate mind hyphen body, and I want to use it as one word. It is coming along more as one word in general use. So this is, a, this is like being awake, being asleep, being a stone, psychedelic states, various meditative states, various yogic and prayer states, and on and on and on and on. So there's an enormous number of these states, or programs as I've called them in the earlier slide. So if we're going to have a complete view of the mind, we have to have a view of the mind in every mind-body state, not just our ordinary state. And if you study psychology, almost all of what you studied is probably how our mind works in its ordinary awake state. For example, cognitive psychology is the study of how we think in our ordinary awake state. Now, there's some nice work on dreams and some hypnosis and some meditation. This is beginning to, we're beginning to overcome this limitation. But generally, when people talk about the human mind, what they mean is the mind in our ordinary awake mind-body state. Residence is the, the third topic. 
And this basically points out or assumes that everything we do, all of our capacities, are expressions of a particular mind-body state. Um, just as in a computer, the program that you've installed and brought up comes out with certain sorts of type of output. In our bodies, the program that we install and use comes out with certain types of outputs. And so we can look at everything we do as, be, as residing in a particular mind-body state or being an expression of that state. Now, this is important because of one of the questions it'll raise. We'll, we'll get there in just a minute. So the adaptability issue, I'm, that's always in the orange at the bottom of the screen, um, says that when we increase number of states is an increased repertoire of capacities. Um, let me just skip ahead here. No, I'll go back. Um, so as we have more capacities, not only cognitive, but also emotional and biological and physical, um, we, are, we are more adaptable. And it's the ability to adapt to different situations that's important in, 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 um, in, in, in improving ourselves individually and as a culture. Uh, these ideas are, oh, here comes the, we're all used to commercials. Well, Americans are anyway. So this is my commercial. Um, these, this is uh, developed in more detail in my book called Psychedelic Horizons. Uh, and if you want to know where I live, there it is. Not that particular house, but that's the area that I live in, in northern Illinois. Um, it's all uh, corn and soybeans, which is a very good business to be in right now, by the way. <clears throat> okay, cognitive enhancement is an area that's getting a lot of attention in uh, publications that have to do with, with universities and higher education. Right now, what they're looking at is uh, common um, drugs that are prescribed largely for children with attention deficit disorder are being used by graduate students and professors in their work. And the questions are, should they do this? Is this cheating? And so forth. So the cognitive enhancement field, I think, would be greatly enhanced if they start looking at psychedelics as a way to enhance cognitive abilities. And we'll be talking about some of those in just a minute. So I think this field needs to be greatly enlarged and the cognitive enhancement field needs to be enhanced itself. We'll be looking at um, cognitive enhancement in four different fields, the nature of the mind, intelligence, values and ethics, and values and ethics will sort of lead us right into religious and spiritual development, and then I'll make some comments about higher education. So this is Charlie Tart's statement about psychology, and in a applies to not only psychology, but to any other discipline that you're in. And he points out very appropriately, the most important obligation of any science is that its descriptive and theoretical language embrace all the phenomena of the subject matter. The data from altered states of consciousness, or mind-body states, I'd call it, cannot be ignored if we are to develop a comprehensive psychology. Um, this came out in his book, uh, Altered States of Consciousness, in 1969, which really got the feel of altered states rolling. He wanted to teach a course as a young professor about altered states of consciousness. His department chairman said, well, that's very interesting, but there isn't enough out there to, write, to teach a course about. So he did the, the professor's move as you collect all this stuff together into an anthology and publish it. And that was the beginning of the of altered states of consciousness appearing in uh, psychology texts. Um, the publisher didn't think there'd be much demand for it, so they printed the minimum number, 5,000 copies, and it sold out. So they printed another 5,000, and they sold out. And this was the hardcover edition, so they printed a paperback edition, and it's been in print ever since. Now, it's gone through a number of different publishers, but this is the, sort of the key foundation book in Aldous States. And he reports on uh, 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 Aldous Huxley, there's some beginning, in fact, one of the very first biofeedback articles was published in this book. It's a fine book to, to get together in this. But for what we're looking at, if we're going to have a, a fully developed mind, we have to look at our minds in every mind-body state. And it's important in this conference to point out that psychedelics are just one family in the whole tribe of psychotechnologies. I mean, there are lots of meditation and breath work. Um, there are... Um, yogas, there are martial arts, and on and on and on. So we're, we have just one sort of piece of this whole multi-state pie. 
But one thing that emerges from this is that we can see ourselves and meditators and, and researchers and, and uh, yoga can see themselves as contributing to a whole larger field of mind-body states, not these separate little fields that are sort of odd little areas of psychology, so curiosities but of no practical interest. In fact, a major human trait that has been neglected is our ability to produce and use a large number of mind-body states. The residence question comes up with this one. And if we see that all of our abilities reside in different mind-body states, and suddenly there are hundreds, if not thousands, of mind-body states, we get to ask the question, how does whatever our favorite topic is, intelligence, learning, performance, vary from mind-body state to mind-body state? And since most of the research has been done only on our, other, on our ordinary state, this is the possibility of asking the same question for all those other states produced by all those hundreds or thousands of technologies. This just blows the roof off areas of study in academia. Because whatever you're interested in, just start asking, what's it like in this state and that state and that state and that? And all of a sudden you realize we have these enormous holes of knowledge that need to be filled. So the adaptive advantage then is that this is, allows us to use our ability in all mind-body states, not just our, our ordinary state, um, and its resident capacities. Now, another angle on this is that, let me see if I got this, no, let me go back, is that when we say something is possible or impossible, what we're generally meaning is that in our ordinary state, it is possible or impossible. So a lot of things that we say, think are impossible may be impossible in an ordinary state, that doesn't mean they're possible or impossible in other states. Now, this doesn't mean that any damn thing you can think of is possible. I never think I'm gonna flap my arms and fly, but I might be able to do out of the body work. So um, the, this, this is a, raises the question of, are there a lot of abilities that we think are impossible in our ordinary state that are possible in other states? And I think there are. Um, I'm gonna bring up a, a one or two of them. Placeboing is one. And you notice I've turned this into a gerund, not the placebo. Um, the question then is how does placeboing vary from mind body state to mind body state? Now, what do I mean by placeboing? If you look at research that's done in medicine, they always use a placebo, maybe, either, maybe something that's inactive or something that's not supposed to affect whatever it is that, that they want to measure. And about one third of the patients, the subjects who've had placebos will improve. And it's not just they say, they tell you they feel better, they're not just grateful patients. You can actually measure their, their illness and it'll decrease, um, their immune system will increase or something or other. So here's the question. To, to say that, that something, this change in people is affected by something that has no effect just doesn't make sense. It's absolutely illogical. But people accept this. They say, oh, that's just the placebo effect. But if a third of the patients are getting better, what is going on with that third? What are they doing? How are they getting better? Okay, they are doing something, and that is what I call placeboing. Now, if placeboing is an activity that we do, for example, when you're happy and you're healthy and your life is going well, you're less likely to get sick than if your life is going terribly and you've broken up in a relationship and so forth. The, the latter group really does suppress the immune system. You can measure the suppression. Um, so if, the, if minor daily events in our life boost the immune system, what about the overwhelmingly positive event of a mystical experience or state of unity of consciousness? Uh, as far as I know, this is the most positive event one can have with, with the possible exception of direct um, um, electrical stimulation of the pleasure centers in the brain. And I'm not sure whether that suppresses this or not. So if, if a little bit of emotional daily events make the, the, the immune system stronger, what about an exceedingly powerful event? So the question then is, does this reside in other mind-body states? And if you look at the healing on spontaneous healing, miraculous healing, religious healings, the descriptions of the person's psychological state very frequently uh, match the description of a mystical experience. And since psychedelics can produce mystical experiences, do psychedelic-induced mystical experiences boost the immune system? You see what that does? 
I can't imagine anything to make psychedelics more acceptable than finding out that that happens. And in fact, there are two studies now that are kind of looking at that. Um, and um, I hope next year or the year after we'll have some data on that. So we're getting, we're, we've talked about mind. And um, here's another possible, interesting possibility. Um, most people who use a mind-body technique, whether it's meditation or a drug or whatever, this group is probably anomalous in that sense, tend to use only one at a time. Um, so what we know about these different mind-body states basically is our ordinary state, and then there's the things we've learned from meditation, hypnosis, contemplative prayer, and on and on and on. But what happens if we combine these together in new recipes? So instead of using one at a time, what happens if we use, let's say, psychedelics, um, progressive relaxation, and hypnosis, and listening to a, a very moving piece of uh, classical music? You see, it's possible to put these together in new recipes. And this is a huge area that has yet to be looked at. Because um, this, what this would do is produce new mind-body states. Just as in chemistry, a lot of good chemistry is synthetic chemistry. That is, you put chemicals together in ways they've never been put together before. In fact, this is basically almost all uh, contemporary chemistry. Or in physics, there are the elements that are created in the lab, the, the artificial elements. This allows us to produce artificial or new mind-body states. And the question, of course, then is, what are the abilities that are in those states? Are they useful for anything? Probably most of them aren't. And I don't want to be the first subject. Okay, I'm, I'm too um, careful about myself for that. But the question, the question is there. And this is one of the huge areas. I can imagine in, this, in the 21st century, since we're looking forward to this, a whole new group of mind designers, mind architects, mind engineers, who put these together in different combinations and find out you know, what works together and what doesn't, just like you put different types of carbon and nitrogen together to make all kinds of different compounds. OK, we've moved from mind, and now I want to say a few words about intelligence. Um, I'm going to be using two major theories of intelligence, uh, one from Howard Gardner. He's best known uh, in educational psychology, which is my background, uh, for the multi-state idea. And he says that there are, there are uh, five different, uh, seven different types of intelligence. He's actually added an eighth, and he added a ninth and took it back, and now I'm wondering whether he should add it again. Now, the way he defines intelligence is, is fascinating. Um, he defines it as the ability to solve problems or produce products of value in a society. So the definition depends on the society you're in. If an ability no longer is useful for that society, that's no longer considered an intelligence. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very odd approach to intelligence he's using. But if we look at, at psychedelics from that perspective, um, what we find is that a number of problems um, of service to, to our society have occurred, have been solved in psychedelic states. And this first one is the best well-known no, well one. Um, Kerry Mullis got the Nobel Prize for inventing the PCR technique. In biology, a problem was that you often would have a sample too small to analyze. And you see, if you, if you watch uh, CSI, they're always finding, you know, a few cells from somebody and then amplifying it to find out who the person is. Um, the way he, uh, he clearly uh, says he invented this is that during an LSD session, he learned to visualize. And then he took that visualization ability and brought it back to his ordinary awake state. And when he was there, he could, as he says, get down in a cell and just watch the molecules go by. And when he did that, he had the idea for the PCR technique, which is a way of solving the small sample problem by enlarging the sample so you have a big enough sample to do an, an analysis of. Now, this is interesting not only because he learned the technique in, in an altered state brought about by psychedelics, because it also shows the transfer of an ability from one state to another. And we've all, we've all woken up in the morning, you know, you know you've dreamt and you can't remember the dream, and then around 10, 30 in the morning, the whole thing like downloads well, this is taking information from one altered state, the dream state, and finally being able to access it. So this addresses also that problem of accessing different 
states? And can we learn things in some states and then transfer them back to our ordinary state? Crick, this is a questionable one. Uh, you know, he's the guy who came up with the double helix model of the human um, uh, genetic system. Um, there was a newspaper reporter named Alan Rees for a British newspaper who interviewed Crick and um, challenged him and said that um, he thought that Crick came up with the idea of the double helix uh, during an L because he was taking LSD. Now, at this time, LSD was used in the academic community in light doses in order to, quote, think outside the box. <clears throat> and Crick did deny it, but what he said was, if you print that, I will sue you. And a poor newspaper reporter does not want to be sued by one of the greatest Nobel laureates of all times. But after Crick died, okay, he wrote an obituary for Crick mentioning this. Also, one of Crick's associates was the person who invented the way of, of making LSD relatively easily of, um, compared with the previous way of making it. Harmon was a professor of um, engineering economic systems at Stanford. He, um, when, back when it was legal, um, he thought that LSD could be used in problem solving, so he got um, 27 professionals who had been working on professional problems and been unable to solve them. So they'd been working on it, some for, uh, for actually years. Um, they included engineers, architects, physicists, um, design, uh, people who were designing stationary, um, all kinds of people who had different professional problems. So to be admitted into the group, you had to have a problem and work on it. So in a sense, you sort of filled your mind with all the information you can get on it. He divided them into groups of four people and um, gave them a, a moderate dose of LSD, had them relax for a while and listen to music. And then the group would come together and discuss their problem and say, well, this is my problem, this is what I'm trying to do, you know, to the other members of the group, really just to sort of get the, the conscious going on, it, on the problem, and then work separately uh, to try to come up with a solution. And of the 27 problems that people presented, he had 29 solutions. One person actually had a couple solutions. Now, this, was, this is a good example of LSD in a problem-solving capacity, and it fits the ability to solve problems or produce products of value in society. So this is an example of using psychedelics um, to boost intelligence by using the intelligence of other mind-body states. The common one we probably all have is when you're working on a problem, you go to bed and you wake up at 2 in the morning with just the right phraseology or the solution to the problem. That's an example of using intelligence in a dream state or in a sleeping state. So this gets at this question of how does intelligence vary from mind-body state to mind-body state? See, this is an example. When you start using that question, you start looking for intelligence, in this case, producing uh, products or values to society in other states. Sternberg is the psychologist with the uh, probably most common use of, um, of uh, intelligence. And I love, I love little short definitions. And his definition of mental self-management, I think, is just right. Now, what he's talking about is how we manage our ordinary awake state. But if we're going to talk about the mind in every mind-body state, then we have to expand that to talk about mental self-management in every state. Anybody wants to do some research? Boy, you've got years and years of research. There's enough research in here to keep every researcher busy for probably at least several hundred years. Now, if, if part of intelligence is not just using a state, it's also choosing the correct state to be in. And if any of you are performers and you know what it is when you get in the zone, or for an athlete and you know what it is when the coach sort of works you up for a game, that is producing a state of consciousness that is functional for that particular performance. So it seems to me that in addition to using every state intelligently, there's the question of how do we learn to choose the appropriate state for the task at hand? And this, I call this meta-intelligence. It's the ability to choose the right state for, for whatever you're doing. And I think there's a whole realm to be looked at of, in addition to teaching people to use states, they have to learn to use which state at which time for which purpose. Thank you, Richard, for this. Um, this um, is a quotation you see from Charles Darwin. It is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but those most responsive to change. And increasing our repertoire 
of cognitive and emotional physical abilities makes us able to become more responsive to change. And I was fascinated with Michael's talk this morning, thinking, I wonder if this is what he's, what he's getting at. I wish I knew enough biology to understand it. OK, now we go over to, to the uh, topic of uh, ethics. Um, this is a quotation from David Wolfe's book, The Psychology of Religion, which looks at the effect of mystical experiences on ethical judgments. These are not necessarily psychedelic mystical experiences. They're just mystical experiences in general. But they set the tone of looking at states of unity of consciousness or mystical experiences um, and the value that they have, not just in a religious sense. Among the predictable characteristics of mystical experience are a sense of sacredness of all life, a desire to establish a more harmonious relation with nature and with other human beings, but only an emphatic self-forgetting, that's ego transcendence, mystical experience, mystical outlook, it could be argued, can restore to humankind the attitude toward life that will make possible for its long-term survival. So here is a very practical use of, of psychedelics or other ways of producing mystical experiences, other mind-body states that are states of unity of consciousness. And in, uh, there was a, a survey of people who uh, have done different types of drugs. Um, this was published in the um, Journal of Psychoactive Drugs uh, just this year. Um, the two surveyors, Lerner and Livers, one was in Israel, one was in Australia, and they, served drug user, they surveyed drug users and drug non-users. So there are three groups in here. They're drug non-users, people who use psychedelic drugs, and people who use other drugs but not psychedelic drugs. And he wanted to see their ethical uh, views toward a number of different things. Um, and what he found is that those who use psychedelic drugs compared with the non-users and the, and the non-psychedelic users uh, were, were higher in valuing spirituality, concern for others, and concern for the environment. They were high in empathy, um, but also the users of other illegal drugs were higher in empathy. And um, they were high in coping ability, and both um, psychedelic and non-users in general were good at, at coping. Now, this is a, a report of people in a survey. It's not an experimental study where you measure the values, give them a, a psychedelic or other drug, and then measure the values later. But look what this opens the door to experimental ethical studies. See, ethics doesn't have to be a member of sitting, a, a known uh, a limitation to sitting in a chair and thinking about things. We can actually do experimental studies in ethics by giving people mystical experiences and seeing whether their values change. Here's another um, a similar study. Um, this is in a book, uh, which is a very readable book called um, uh, the, the title of the book is Quantum Change. This is an article summary of it that came out later. Um, a, um, a psychiatrist in New Mexico who works with alcoholics uh, discovered several alcoholics sort of stopped being alcoholics after they had mystical experiences. These were not drug mystical experiences. They were just mystical experiences. And um, he, this didn't fit in with what he knew, a lot like what Stan Groff was describing this morning. So um, what he did is he wanted to collect these instances. So he and his co-author put an ad in the local papers. They said, we would like to talk to people who have had this type of experience. Please give us a call. And they got, uh, I think it was 50-some people to describe their experience. And they asked them, how was your life different after the mystical experience as different from before the mystical experience? Now, he has a list of 50, and these are just the, the top five. But um, you'll notice that um, there's more interest in sort of in religious, spiritual issues and in socially responsible issues than, um, than just uh, um, sort of what do I get out of life. Quantum Change is a very, very nice book. So this leads us sort of into the religious area. And... Um, this is a, a quotation from the study that's been mentioned a couple of times that was done at uh, Johns Hopkins University and published in the summer of 2006. 
Uh, let me also say there's a follow-up study um, which confirms this of the subjects or volunteers, they call them, um, for 14 months later. Also, Rick's study of the Good Friday experiment, the quarter century follow-up, gives a very long view of this. So the, all this information just confirming the rest of the information that's out there. So this is the, the, a summary sentence from this, from this article. When administered to volunteers under supportive conditions, knows under supportive conditions, they have a nice sort of living room like set up there with a couch and paintings and a nice rug. Um, psilocybin occasioned mystical experiences similar to spontaneously occurring mystical experiences, and they're their standard ways of measuring this, which were evaluated by the volunteers as having substantial and sustained personal meaning and spiritual significance. Now, the, the religious implications of this are quite obvious, the spiritual significance. But what we've also got here is experimental studies in religion. So it's possible to move religion from paying attention, interpreting texts, um, prayers, and so forth, into actually doing an, an experimental religious studies. I would love to see a religious studies program grab onto this. I think they have a lot of volunteers, for one thing. Um, but um, we'd, this um, has a, uh, maybe a major move in, in society. And one of the reasons psychedelics have so much, meet so much resistance. I mean, most clergy are not going to like the idea that, um, you know, somebody can have a direct experience. I think it's more accurate to say it's an experience which people sometimes label as religious rather than call it a religious experience, because there also are secular mystical experiences. Uh, Ralph Hood is the guy who has studied mystical experiences and developed something called the M scale, which is a scale of mystical experiences. And some are very clearly uh, spiritual and some are very clearly secular. So um, it need not be uh, associated with a religion. Well, let me say, this is just the, the data that comes out of the study that Griffiths et al. did. They asked, how personally meaningful was the experience? And you can see the percentages across the bottom. The dark one is psilocybin. This is, uh, this is Ritalin. Okay, so that was the active control that they used. And um, you see the single most important, uh, around 10%, among the top five most important, way up in the 50th percent, and then Ritalin starts to cut in, and when you get down to, oh, this is an experience I have once a month or once a week or every day, um, that, that the Ritalin comes into there. So this brings up a really intriguing idea. Um, are, is Western religion going through a new era of change? 500 years ago, what most religion was, was rights, I mean for the common person living in, we in the Western society. You went to church on Sunday or on Friday. Um, you prayed. You did a number of things, OK? And being religious meant you did these behaviors. Along with the movable, print, uh, movable type and printing press, text became available. And we moved from a religion of right and activity to a religion of text-oriented. And our religions today are basically text-oriented. If you want to make a religious point, you go to your religious text and you say, well, this is what it says. Different people have different interpretations. But see, the thing is, you go back to the word. We are in a word-oriented religion, religions. Um, if, if we meet somebody and we want to ask what their religion is, we don't ask, what rights do you do? We ask, what do you believe? See, that's a verbal thing. A belief is a verbal thing. It's words. And we have dogma, creeds, um, uh, doctrine, these are all word things. You see, we are in a word period of religion. So this is a, this is a huge change. Now, we didn't give up the rights, okay, but they're often seen in a, in a new light. And um, so after this 500-year blizzard of words and religion, maybe a new sacred behavior is coming along. Instead of having sacred rites and sacred text, we now get to sacred experience. And this is one of the major issues that will never be uh, uh, solved, I think, the question of whether psychedelics present a, quote, a genuine religious experience or a fake religious experience. And many people feel that they're, they are genuine. Um, a lot of people feel they are fake. But there's an interesting middle ground in here. 
A lot of learning takes place in simulations. I mean, it may be kindergartners standing there with tapes on the floor that represent the sidewalk and the road, and they're supposed to stop when they get to the road, and you know, the simulation of how to, how to get to school and back safely. And simulations go through all kinds of training. Okay. Now, even if you take the position that, that psychedelics provide an illegitimate or non-genuine experience, they might be very good approximations. So somebody who's had a, a mystical experience with psychedelics who doesn't want to admit, wow, this is a real sacred experience, might want to admit, this is a good preparation. I have a sense of what it's like. Okay? I, I understand the idea of mystical sacred experience better because I've had this experience. I expect that this issue will never be resolved, like so many religious issues. So um, I, I think we're in a whole new area of, of, of a uh, new kind of reformation. I, I think of the earlier one as being sort of the Gutenberg Reformation, and this being the Wasson Ref Reformation, named for our Gordon Wasson, who did so much primary work on uh, psychoactive plants in Mexico and, and Asia and so forth. So if we're going through this, this is a big change. I mean, uh, culture changed enormously um, when text became the center of knowledge. And how will culture change if direct experience becomes the center of knowledge. So I think that the, some of the things we need in society are an institute or actually institutes for mind-body studies. Or there might be a number of separate ones. One for psychedelics, one for meditation, one for yoga, one for breathing techniques, and so forth and so forth. And so what these all do is, is contribute to the, our adaptability by teaching us to be to have a larger repertoire of thoughts, cognitions, physical abilities, emotional abilities, and so forth, by getting the full range of mind-body states and all those abilities as they reside in every mind-body state. We're, we're just scratching what it means to be a human. So also this allows experimental studies of mind. And psychedelics and other mind-body techniques can be used both as independent variables where you change the mind-body state and you find out how this influences all these other things. Or you can do things to produce different mind-body states and they're the de dependent variables in this. So we, we, we basically looked at mind, um, intelligence, values and ethics, and religious and spiritual development um, thanks to psychedelics. Um, another ad, um, I've developed this, these ideas more uh, thoroughly in my book, Psychedelic Horizons. And the last chapter's title is, Is the Reprogrammable Brain Adaptogenic? Those of you who got here early and got the handout, that the first page of the handout is uh, from that last chapter. I didn't expect so many people. I'm very delighted, but I wish I had brought along more copies. There's an article up on the, on the, uh, the, the posters that are on the way to the Samarkand room where the rising researchers are. Okay, thank you, and um, use all your mind-body states. <laughs>